Hello guys, I am here at Afri Forum's uh, headquarters with Aaron's Roots for the much um, waited for live stream here where I'm going to ask him some difficult questions. I had a bit of a chuckle the other day with uh, when Kali Krul quoted the, the results of the poll where he said that 80% of Afrikaners support Afri Forum or Afri Forum's ideas and then another 10% is on the left and another 10% is on the right of Afri Forum. So I think it, that's a rather skewed statistics. I would rather say about 60% of Afri, Afrikaners uh, support Afri Forum and then another 20% is a bit to the right of Afri Forum, but they still support them, but they feel a bit more to the right. And then another 15% would be two to the right of Afri Forum to, uh, to support them. And then maybe 5%, the 5% that dominates the media and, uh, those those places are to the left of Afri Forum, and they are the ones that always get the chance to talk and uh, give their opinions. And then it seems like they are actually in the majority, but it is not like that. So today we have a chance to ask Aaron's Roots some questions from a, a right wing perspective. So that it's not only the leftists that give, gives him trouble. And I've got some quite um, very interesting questions here that I already have received. So let's start with them. The first one is from Herman. Herman says, Aristotle said that, and I quote, this Athenian experiment called democracy would only have worked in a completely homogenous society. Nowhere in the world does the, these words ring more true than in the failed state of the so-called rainbow nation. Will Afri Forum thus support total self-determination for every people in South Africa? Um, thank you, Willem, uh, and thank you for the question. Um, perhaps before I answer the question, uh, let me say thank you for this opportunity and maybe to comment on your introductory remarks. Um, so the 80% the reference that was made by Kali Kriel is, of course, not a, a scientific study that was done, but um, it's, a, it's more a, let's call it a strategy or a positioning principle. Um, it would be very interesting to know what the actual numbers uh, are, but in terms of how many people, how many Afrikaners in particular support AfriForum, how many do not because they regard AfriForum as too left-wing, or how many do not because they regard AfriForum as too right-wing. But I do very much agree with what you said uh, regarding Afrikaners who are to the right of AfriForum, to use that ref frame of reference, in uh, in the sense that I think... There might be, I think, regardless of whether you support Afri Forum, um, I think if you if you draw up a bell curve and you say who's on the left and who's on the right, you would find that those on the left find it very easy to get positions of influence where they become editors of newspapers and, and uh, that type of thing, and they get public platforms, while those who are on the right um, are scorned and ridiculed and they don't get uh, those positions. So um, to get to the question... Um, I agree with the notion about democracy in homogeneous societies. I think um, it, it, the comment that was made by, uh, quoted of Aristotle, uh, we find in the United States, for example, uh, many of the commentators that I um, like to follow in the United States, I would find that some of the things they say about democracy and human rights, and especially individualism, are not really that applicable to South Africa. Uh, largely because the United States, although not completely, it's a much more homogeneous society than South Africa. That South Africa is a country that's very diverse, I mean, as we all know, and with various cultures and ethnic groups and so forth. And I do think that that makes democracy more difficult. Uh, there's a quote by um, Winston Churchill um, said that democracy is probably the worst form of government, but it's still better than except for the others that have been tried so far. And I think that's an appropriate way to describe it. So, um, yes, I, th I don't think democracy is as practical and as useful as people would like to think, especially in, in um, multi-plural societies. Um, and, yes, self-determination and the principle thereof, we believe, is very important. We we like to use the term self-governance or self-management, of self bestir as the Afrikaans term. And in principle, that should be supported. I think where the debate lies or should lie is not whether Afriforum supports it, 
I think it should rather be how do we do this in practice. Yeah. Herman actually made a follow-up question. He said he presumes Aaron's will say, say something in the lines of demographics determines destiny. In other words, the fact that the peoples of South Africa are so uh, mixed here yeah, and not mixed in the senses in marriages and so on, but they live in the same areas that it's very difficult to get self-determination. Um, and then he said that uh, self-determination will be will be difficult, but will Afriforum then maybe push hard for a Swiss-like canton system of financial self-determination where every people is allowed to use their own tax money for their own interests? And then he says, if yes, I will throw in my full support behind Afriforum. And he also said he works in the financial sector and he knows many others in the financial sector and the econo economic sector that will also then throw their support in behind Afriforum if they push hard for a system like this. Yeah. Um, thank you. I didn't say that, said that because that is part of my um, our view is that demographics is extremely important. Um, and there's a reason why the issue of demographics is relevant when talking about self-governance or whatever term you want to use to refer to self-determination. Um, and that is where I think the debate lies. Um, I sometimes, and I, I don't know, I know many Hermans, I don't know which one this is, I don't know if I know this person, but so this is, so, so this is not a reference to this particular person, um, but what I sometimes get frustrated about, there, there are a lot of things, I find that there are many words that people love to use that they like to talk about it and they talk about it a lot, but oftentimes you find that those who talk about it the most are the ones who know the least about it. And I'm not referring, I'm making a general comment. And uh, apartheid is one of those terms, but I think uh, a word that's very popular on the right is, is self-determination. And it's a very important word, but I think the most, at least in our view, the, most imp the single most important thing to understand about self reliance being dependent on yourself for your future as opposed to the state is that it's not it's not a de facto reality that you claim or you demand from government it's a day sorry the other way around it's not a de jure reality that you claim from government it's a de facto reality and what i mean by that is you do not get a form of self-determination by campaigning for it uh, by saying listen we're going to do a petition now and we're going to make an appointment with the state president and in terms of section 135 of the South African constitution, we are going to demand our self-determination. That's just not the way it works. That's, it hasn't ever worked like that in any state or any country that has, that has received some form of self-determination. It works the other way around. It works by, by creating a, an independence from, from government through institutions. And once that community has become completely independent from government, then those type of talks can uh, can come up. And then what happens then is that a particular reality has been created, a de facto reality has been created. And once that has been created, then the only thing that's left to do is for the authorities to recognize there's nothing we can do to change this reality. We are simply going to accept that this is the reality. So for example, if I'm, I'm using an extreme example, let's say, the state president, Cyril Ramaphosa, or the United Nations, or someone comes and says, um, Afrikaners, we are going to give you self-determination. What do we do then? Uh, especially in the context that we are now, because um, we wouldn't know, I think there would be a massive debate about where would it be and who would it include and what form would it take up and so forth. And that's not, that's the, the wrong way around to approach it. The, the correct way is to build institutions. Uh, and that's why there's a term, um, the Afrikaans word is groeiende selfbeskikking or growing self-determination, which means that it grows incrementally. And I think the role that AfriForum can play in that regard is AfriForum can point, can point out, out the theoretical debate. We can point out what's happening with the Canton system, which we support, and say we support this principle. But our campaign wouldn't be to say we want to demand that what the this, this system that's being implemented in Switzerland should be implemented in South Africa because we don't think it's realistic or practical. Our focus in 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 terms in the, within the context of self determination would rather be 
to ensure that people that we we strengthen our institutions, we create new institutions where we need to, and where there are already institutions to strengthen them and to make them more independent and self reliant from government. While you were talking, I read through the comments here and the questions and so on, and I see there's a lot of people asking, uh, what do you think about the succession of the Cape and King Cornelius and all of that stuff? And I would like you to answer that. But something else that I picked up in our conversation that I actually want to ask, uh, firstly, you said that you don't think that the Canton system will work in South Africa. And I, I think in, in a sense, I do disagree with that because what we have there in Switzerland is we have inequality between the Germans and the Swiss and the Italian and the Roman Swiss. But nobody feels this victim mentality or this entitlement. Uh, we know the Germans have more, far more money per capita than any of the other three groups. And they are allowed to spend their money in their way, which I f think is fair. And I think in South Africa that can that can work exactly like that. And I think a lot of people um, share my 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 idea there. And then the other thing that I that I want to ask you is you talk about this uh, sort of a, a, a parallel state where 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 we, we take over parts of the of the uh, what do you call it um of the 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 things that the state have to do the municipalities and stuff like that. Is Afriforum trying to, to do that already? Is Afriforum already trying to, to create this, this sort of a, a parallel state? Um, thank you. Well, um, the first question was about the Western Cape. I think, um, in principle, we would always... Uh, our um, default position has always been decentralization of power is a good thing. So... Um, so in principle, I think that is something that should seriously be be looked at um, and ways that could happen. Um, I'm not saying my reference to the Canton system was not that if we were to have that system in South Africa, then it would be unrealistic. What I meant to us or what I said was that to try to achieve that through means of political negotiations is unrealistic. So in other words, to try to start a campaign, for example, and to say, we need to replace the South African constitution with a constitution that that makes South Africa more the, the South African si uh, political structure more similar to that of Switzerland, um, and to draw up a petition and to start negotiating with government to have this done. I think that is unrealistic. I think if if we were to use this as a hypothetical example, let's say we were to say this is what we need to achieve. We need to achieve the South African political or get the South African political system to be the same as the Swiss system. The way to achieve that is not through political negotiations. The way to achieve that is to just start implementing the system, to just start creating that system, and then say, "Well, this is at eventually after ten or twenty years to say, well, this is the real, this is the reality in South Africa." Um, so my reference to institutions was not so much about municipalities, and the, I know the word parallel state has been used a lot in reference to the broader solidarity movement. We, our view is that usually the state is part of the problem so or the source of the problem so we don't want to duplicate the problem and be the state or be a parallel state to use that term um, our focus is on civil society so there's not an attempt to duplicate what the state is doing i think the focus is more on achieving that that you um, mentioned but not through quote unquote taking over municipalities but rather to to get people to to become more involved to for example do the and that's what we're doing already we've got more than 100 branches across the country and people we've had a few cases where for example the sewage system wasn't working municipality is not doing anything about it the afri forum branch goes and replaces the entire system or fix the system and they then send the bill to the municipality so afri forum has started taking over that in a de facto manner, it, it wasn't done through negotiations. We just went and we did it. The same with fixing potholes, which is on a smaller scale. But the focus is not really on taking over the work of municipalities. I think the focus is more on, on, let's call it cultural institutions in the broad sense of the word, including independent media institutions, independent uh, or private uh, universities or ter tertiary institutions, uh, independent cultural organizations, and. Um, and becoming more involved with private security to do to take all of those functions let's to use those terms to take it over in other words to do it ourselves um, and not to be dependent of the state and in doing so we are already creating a particular reality uh, which is one 
where we break the, the chain of government dependency and we start doing things for ourselves. I actually want to add to that, um, and that actually adds to the, the first question that we had of democracy versus republicanism. Here in South Africa, we have real democracy, which is the will of the people. And I've been speaking to a, a, a man named Jaap Kel, that is the head of the South African Taxpayers Union, and he said he can't even remember how many court cases he was in where the judge told him that legally he is right but he can't he can't give him that uh, uh, that outcome in court because that will cause chaos the people will revolt to that and what that was was basically municipalities that they wanted to take over where the municipality like 60 percent of the municipalities here in south africa just failed and the taxpayers union said well we want to use the this tax money to uh to uplift the municipality by ourselves and in some cases uh, they have achieved that like in sunny's off but in other places the judges just said no you, you this is legally this is the right thing that you do but uh but you, we can't do that because it's not the, it's not the will of the people and that links with uh democracy being a bad system uh i think it was dinesh de souza that said that the the biggest achievement of the left was making everyone believe the lie that america is is a democracy which america was never a democracy it was never in their constitution ever mentioned that they are a democracy they've ever be, always been a republic and a republic is where the rule of the law determines what happens in a country versus a democracy which we have here in south africa is where the will of the people or in other words the will of the majority of the people is the is basically the law uh, i see a very interesting question here Adams. Uh, can you please give an example of a group which used uh, self-determination to create a new reality and the government had to eventually recognize that um yes i think south tyrol is a good example um south tyrol is a it's not an independent state there were actually i think there are many examples east timor is an example of that uh kosovo is an example of that to an agree, you can say Scotland is an example of that. Um, so there are many examples. Uh, South Tyrol, if we use that, it's a province in the north. Uh, Alto Adige is the name of the province in the north of Italy. Majority German-speaking people there, Tyrolians, as they refer to themselves. Tyrol used to be that province and a big part of um, Austria, as we know today. And Tyrol was then made part of Italy. There's a long, very interesting history about the pact, a pact between Adolf Hitler and Mussolini about um, the Tyrolians and forcing them to either become Italians. They even had to change their names from German names to Italian names. They uh, Going to a German school was illegal. Um, they either had to go back to Germany or go to Germany or become Italians in the true sense of the word. And they, they had a very intensive freedom struggle um, against the uh, Italian government. And they have reached the point um, where, where they are now, they are referred to as an autonomous province, which is a form of self-determination. So they are part of the Italian state, but they are different from the rest of Italy in the sense that they literally keep 90% of their tax. So the taxes, when they pay taxes, 10% of that goes to the central government, 90% of that they can keep for themselves or they they use that for their own purposes and the the reason the way they achieve this obviously no government would want to say well for that particular province you can keep 90 percent of your taxes especially if that's uh, if those people are paying the mo uh, significantly more taxes per capita than, than other groups of people in the country. yes exactly so they are the wealthiest part of italy and uh I've heard that they are the wealthiest region in the whole of Europe, um, uh, South Tyrol. And the way they achieved that was not through negotiating um, uh, with the Italian government. They tried that, but it didn't work. They just, uh, Margaret Thatcher once said, uh, people came to see, I think, people from Argentina about the, was it the Falkland Islands? And people were very concerned that she would have uh, given too many concessions and afterwards, People said to her, what did you give them? And she said, I gave them tea and sympathy. And that's what the Italian government gave the Tyrolians. And that's what, that's what the South African government is giving Afrikaners. They, they are giving us tea and sympathy. Um, so they, they literally created that reality. And they've come to a point where um, the Italian government realized that they would either lose that province 
or they would have to make those concessions. And there's still an independent str uh, struggle in, in South Tyrol, but they've reached that point already. Kosovo, uh, in Kosovo, there was a, a, I guess you can call it a genocide, but also it was a particular reality that eventually the, the government the, uh, the government couldn't ignore it anymore, and they were forced to acknowledge this is the reality. This is what what we need to accept. Um, you made a point about democracy. I, I, I maybe I should add to that. I want to say two things. I don't want to talk too long to maybe get two more answers. But just on the issue, firstly on the issue of the courts, um, there was a court case. I think it was two thousand and six uh, in a constitutional court. It's called uh, Nyati versus Minister of Justice. Um, it's a very interesting case. There's a particular facts uh, set of facts that's not relevant for this. But what happened there was there was a court order and the court ignored. The court just didn't, or not the court, the state was ordered to do to pay uh, reparations, and they just didn't do it. That the fact that the state didn't abide to the court order was then taken to the constitutional court, and there, in that judgment in the constitutional court, an instruction was given that the um, Department of Justice needs to draw up a report of how many court cases are there, how many court orders were there against the state in which the state never complied with the court order. And they found that there were, I think there were more than 300 at that time. And that was 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. So I'm very curious what the number is at the moment. So that's very true. Uh, and again, it goes back to de facto and de jure. Uh, there's a de facto reality um, and the courts they might recognize it, um, but there's a de facto reality and there's a de jure reality. And, and eventually, um, courts can only do so much. They can recognize there is a de facto reality, but eventually politics uh, on a bigger scale play a bigger role in recognizing the de facto realities. On democracy, yes, I agree. I think democracy, again, it, it works. There was a very interesting study done by two political scientists, uh, Sharon and Lupuente, and they found they took all the measures, or different measures, I shouldn't say all, a variety of measures according to which states are the most best functioning states, like the happiness index and corruption perceptions index and all of those. And then they used, they added a whole bunch of them together and they said, okay, which states are the best and which are the, the worst? And then they said, well, what's the quality of democracy in those governments? And they found the question was, does democracy lead to quality of government? And it's a very, very interesting, I think that's the title of the article. It's an academic article, but it's very interesting. And they, eventually they found, no, it doesn't. Democracy doesn't lead to quality of government. The, it, does, and it does in some circumstances. They said, if it's a more homogeneous state, and if it's a more wealthy state, then a democracy, in other words, a, a democrat, democratic system leads to quality of government may lead to government, that's, I think that's more appropriate. But they found in countries, they didn't use South Africa particularly, but that's what it boils down to. In countries like South Africa, democracy can lead, almost necessarily lead to a worse form of government. And I'm not making an anti-democracy case, that's just what they found. And why did they find that? Because in a country that's um, not, that's very diverse, like South Africa with various cultural groups, that already creates friction. But on top of that, the fact that South Africa is a very poor country with a lot of unemployed people, um, they, they said democracy is like, like supply and demand. You need to have a, the, the, the people need to demand a, a government system that's well functioning, an effective government. There needs to be a demand for that and there needs to be a supply. In other words, a political party that says, yes, vote for us, we will achieve this. The problem in a country like South Africa is there's a demand, or no, let's put it differently. It, the problem with poor countries is there's often a demand for a bad quality of government. Why? Because people who are unemployed would more easily vote for a system which would give them social grants. And they would more easily vote for a system. So there's a supply or a demand for a poor government. And then guess what? The ANC or whoever says, oh, well, we'll, we'll provide you with that poor government, so vote for us. So yes, I don't think democracy... Uh, democracy is a big buzzword, but... Um, I think it's a system, it's an important system. It's like Churchill said, it's it's the worst form of government, but it's better than the others that have been tried. So I think maybe we should keep digging and see if we can find a better system. Yeah, as you said, uh, if uh, uh, Ron Paul, uh, uh, I think all, either, either Ron Paul or Rand Paul said this, that 7% uh, of the people in a country are the haves and usually 93% are the have not. So what 
any de democratic party just has to do is they have to convince the 93 percent they're going to give them what the seven percent have and then just a big enough portion of that 93 percent of people needs to vote for that party and this is why why democracy always lead to tyranny through the ignorance of the people i've seen there's a lot of questions here about race and iq and uh believe me we'll get to that as i promised you guys all the questions will be answered on this stream even the even the most difficult ones uh but there's just first one or two other ones that i have here that i think we need to answer first before we get to race and iq because it's going to fall in place you'll see the other thing is i see there's a lot of people asking about the bruderbond and evie de Klerk and all the money that comes from them we will also answer that as well but uh, also a little bit later first i've got a very very good question here also a very loaded question it's from peter Aaron's you and kali Kriel are always the first to condemn apartheid however there is this toxic false narrative that all inequality in this country is because of apartheid when kali declared when kali declared it was not a crime against humanity it was a great step in the right direction and it, and it almost got uh, me to join afri forum <laughs> Should Afri Forum not maybe start telling the whole truth about apartheid and how um, it was only the communist countries and Sweden, of course, that voted it a crime against humanity. Of course, we know that in uh, apartheid was abolished officially in 1990. So the oldest people who lived, uh, who, start, who was born after apartheid ended are 28 years old now. And some of them even ha have children already. Now, how we can uh, demolish that narrative that uh, all this inequality is because of apartheid. Yeah, Peter also said I should talk about the Koreans in America, where usually the Koreans that come to, I think, Virginia and all those New England states or, the, or where most of those Koreans go to, usually they go to those states, they can't speak English, and then they um, work terrible jobs, they get paid minimum wages or sometimes even under minimum wages, washing dishes all day in a restaurant. And then those immigrants from Korea, their children perform better than any other demographic in all of the United States of America. And their children get better grades at school. Their children are being accepted into, into the Ivy League universities at a, at a higher rate than any other demographic in America. So that just shows you that um, it's not because of inequality. There's no such thing as a legacy of an inequality. If you really have the potential, you really are willing to work hard enough and you've got the potential to do it, you can uplift out of it in a single generation like the Koreans do in America because usually those uh, the children of immigrants from Korea in America have salaries that are higher than any other demographics in America for their age group. So what are your opinion on that? Maybe we should be harder on all the people that that try to blame everything on apartheid in this country. Um, thank you. I, I agree with most of that. Um, and we have been talking about it for quite a bit. Um, I've written an article earlier this year. I can't remember the title of it. I'll put it up on Twitter after this discussion. Um, I think it's apartheid and communism and crimes against humanity. And I've done two fact sheet episodes about that. One about political violence during apartheid and the fact that more than 90% of those who died in political violence during apartheid were killed as a result of the ANC's people's war and not killed by the government. So the government killed about um, 600, I would say somewhere between 600 and 1,000 people um, during the almost 50 years. Uh, of apartheid, uh, where the ANC and Inkata killed like 20,000 people. Um, and now we just hear there were 21,000 deaths in political violence during apartheid. And the assumption is, oh, they were all killed by the government, which is false. Um, so we have been talking about that. I think um, two things on apartheid. I think there are a lot of uh, falsehoods or untruths about apartheid apartheid and about South Africa's history, there's a, there's a carte blanche on apartheid. In other words, it's, an, it's a blank check. You can say whatever you want about apartheid. As long as it's bad, you can say whatever you want. If you can, but you cannot say anything in response to that, even if it's a lie. So that's why we find people who say apartheid was a genocide. And 
it couldn't have been a genocide because the black population doubled in the first two decades of apartheid and then they doubled again in the second two decades. And we have people, I had an ENCA interview, maybe some of the viewers have seen it recently, where the anchor was very aggressively said to me, apartheid had slaves. It was a, a system of slavery. Mm -hmm. um, and it just wasn't that. And then you say, no, it wasn't a policy of slavery. Slavery was illegal. They didn't have slaves. And then they would say, oh, so you are an apartheid denialist. So, so, so we've been accused of that a lot. And so that on the one hand, and, and I think maybe the legacy of apartheid is very true. Um, or the question is, I think we should start asking more questions such as, what, should, what would South Africa have looked at if there wasn't apartheid? Because the assumption is that all black people would have been rich or black poverty wouldn't have been a reality. And I don't, the only evidence that I could find indicates that poverty would still have been a problem. It might even have been worse. Um, so, so that's the one thing. But added to that, I don't think we should position ourselves as trying to defend apartheid or trying to say that it's a system that we need to go back to. Because I think that there were a lot of things that were, you, you need to understand apartheid within the context in which it happened. And I think no, no one's really attempting to even do that. The fact that it happened, it was implemented just after the Boer War, there were already a whole list of segregational laws in place by that was set in place by the British government, um, and there's a, a, yeah there was a lot of things that happened before apartheid which sort of led to the system. That's not to justify it. I don't think there's any way in which again it's easy to sit back with hindsight and to criticize what happened in the but I don't think that we should ever put ourselves in a position why we, where we say if you have a bench in a park or if you have a beach you can you it's morally acceptable to say only white people are allowed to be here and yes there were some places where only black people were allowed that's also not part of the equation today but so is that really is that really in any way significant the way that white people had their own beaches and black people had their own beaches or their own benches at a park for themselves i mean you, you can you can argue about the morality of that as long as you want to but really does that have any significant impact in our lives today well, I think I think it. <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, that, again, it goes back to grand apartheid and small apartheid. And I think the idea behind grand apartheid, which no one is prepared to acknowledge, is the idea behind it was to was to promote self determination for different groups. Of course, it backfired, and we can talk about that. But small apartheid was about saying, well, th this is going to be a whites only bus or whatever. And um, I think the issue there is. It's not so much an issue of inequality, the result thereof, but I think it's an issue of human dignity. Um, and I think we need to acknowledge that. We need to say, listen, that wasn't the way to deal with things. And we need to acknowledge that I don't know how people's, I know there's this whole narrative about facts don't care about your feelings. And I largely agree with that. Although I don't think we should position ourselves as being anti feelings or, or not caring about how people perceive such things. I think it is important to acknowledge that, but but yeah, I, I think I think we need to differentiate between the, the two concepts. So here's where the where the stream is going to get really really exciting because uh, and I'm re very happy it's called Aaron's Roots answering difficult questions because and not Willem Pets are answering difficult questions, and I see there was a lot of these questions about race and IQ in here, and as I said, we're going to answer all of them. So I know for the, the most recent publication that actually tested this was in 2006. It was by um, a Swedish, no, it was by a Finnish professor. It was the, the study was called IQ and the Wealth of Nations in 2006. And they have determined that the Sutus, for example, have an average IQ of 67. And also they have, have determined that the average IQ in South Africa, all races included, it was 77. So now here is where it's going to be a, become very politically incorrect in this live stream. And I'm actually happy that we finally have this in South Africa, politically incorrect YouTube live streams, because <laughs> that's something that has, that has been happening in America for the past two decades, which I think we're really lucky here in South Africa. But in any case, so Adams, what's your opinion on inequality and, and, and race and IQ? Well, I think my my um, short answer to that, uh, that's probably the most politically incorrect question you can ask. And and again, I think it's important to have politically incorrect discussions. Mm -hmm. I think my view on that, I, I haven't read The Bell Curve. Uh, was it by Murray? Um, I think it's the first or sort of the, the 
Magna Carta, maybe that's an exaggeration, but the sort of the cornerstone book about IQ differences between ethnic groups. I've read a bit about it, and I've read a, a one or two reports about that. Um, I have two views on that. My first view is I don't have any reason to to dispute that, to say, no, this is false, it's not true. It could as well be true. Um, it's probably true. I don't know. I'm not an expert. On, I'm not a psychologist. So I don't think that we should try to dispute that. Um, I I do think it's it's um, superficial to try to argue that there are no differences between different groups. Uh, but on the other hand, I feel quite strongly about it that I don't think it's useful to have the debate about race and IQ. Again, we shouldn't we shouldn't try to to hide facts or, or dispute that but the what, what do we achieve if the question we should ask ourselves is what do we achieve if we really push this narrative um i don't i think i can only see that we would achieve negative consequences for ourselves uh if we were to push this regardless of whether it's true or not so i wouldn't i wouldn't push any i wouldn't push an argument about race and iq because it might be true it might not be true i just don't think it's useful all right, but one question that really links to that is we get thrown this whole colonialism debate into our face ad infinitum all the time. Everyone's always just saying colonialism this and colonialism that, and because of colonialism, it's the biggest problems in the world and so forth. But if we, um, if we compare ourselves to Ethiopia, who was never colonized, we see a very significant result. And if we compare ourselves to Hong Kong, which was colonized for a longer time than South Africa was colonized, we also see a very significant result. Ethiopia, that was never colonized, is much worse than South Africa. Basically, the, the biggest difference between South Africa and Ethiopia is that in South Africa, people live in shacks that are made out of zinc. And in Ethiopia, there was no zinc, so people live in shacks made out of mud and grass. And uh, in Hong Kong is today, I think they are in the top five richest countries per capita in the world. And uh, they were colonized for much longer than we were colonized. So can't we use that as a, as a very good argument against everyone that claims that colonialism is the root of all the problems in South Africa? Yes, well, I, also, I don't think it's useful to try to argue that we can only acknowledge that colonialism exclusively has negative consequences. I think it's a very superficial point to try to make, and I don't think you're going to get far. You might... You might pat yourself on the shoulder for being politically correct, but I don't know what you were trying to achieve by saying this. Um, uh, it, that's simply, it, it's not a useful debate to be having. I think, um, I think we should look at that, uh, and we sh uh, I think we should, we should, we should counter this narrative because that's it's it's about cultural relativism in the sense that uh, I think Franz Boas was the first in the early 1900s who, who wrote about he was very much. He was an academic, I think he was a sociologist, and he wrote about, or he did research about sort of trying to disprove that there are biological differences between races. And one of the things, it wasn't so much him that came up with it, but more the people who studied under him, who started pushing this narrative of cultural relativism, which basically means that um, cultures are, all cultures are the same, or... Um, the outcome, the result of, of the actions of people in different cultures would be the same. And if people don't achieve the same thing, that could only be because of oppression. So you can put two cultures next to each other, and if there's nothing that's prohibiting them, they can operate and they can start businesses in different ways, and they can operate in different ways, and they would have the exact same outcome. And if that's not, if they don't have the same outcome, it means the one oppressed the other one. And that's an extremely ridiculous statement to to make and it's one that's accepted by again this is not scientific this is just a view my view it's probably accepted by 70 to 80 percent of people in the world um, that if two groups don't have the same if they don't achieve the same to the same extent then the one oppresses the other one and there's no there's no evidence for that um, all the available evidence indicates that that the way in which you operate the way in which you structure a business your, your work ethos, uh, the type of decisions that you make, that leads to a particular outcome. So culture has a much bigger outcome, a much bigger impact on, um, on outcome and achievement 
than oppression. I think oppression can lead to this to, to inequality. I'm not saying that it's not irrelevant. I'm saying it can lead, but but our default position should not be if there is an inequality, that means there was oppression. Uh, that's just simply not true. All right, I think we we've been politically incorrect for for long enough. Let's let's go trade in in shallower waters again. Uh, Georgia says, "Are you going to sue Ma Julius Malema again for hate speech? And why did you settle outside of court last time? That is a very big problem for most of us Afrikaners on the right. Is why did Afriforum go and settle outside of court with Julius Malema and not push this case until the until the very end?" Well. Thank you, and I'm, I'm very glad we got that question because it's something that I think is important to respond to. Um, there's actually a very simple reason why the matter was settled outside court, uh, which I'll explain now. The first part of the question is not only yes, we will, but yes, we have. I'm sounding like Obama, <laughs> almost. Um, yes, we have. Uh, just last week, we were in court um, for a pre-trial hearing about a hate speech case against Malema and the EFF um, about them singing, white man, you must die. Um, so briefly, the Shoot the Boer case or Dubalai Bunu, it's not the same song as Kill the Boer, Kill the Farmer. It's a song that Malema started singing in March 2010. And um, I've written about it quite a lot in my book, Kill the Boer, um, that's going to be released next week. Um, and how that whole court case proceeded and how he threatened us and so forth. So we took him to court. The ANC was, it was Afriforum versus, Afriforum and Tau SA versus Malema and the ANC. Uh, because he was then still president of the Youth League. Um, it was about whether that song is hate speech or not. We won that case. The judge found, yes, it is hate speech. So, and, and now we need to differentiate because that's what people don't understand. There's a judgment and then there's an order. So a judgment means that's the whole, that's the long document uh, that we, in which all the reasoning and conclusions are made. And then at the end of the judgment, the judge said, so this is what we found. And then we get to the order. Then the order says, therefore, this needs to happen. So the judgment found this is hate speech. The order said a few practical things that Malema has to do. What happened then? The ANC and the EFF, uh, not the EFF, the ANC and Julius Malema appealed that. They said, we're not going to accept this judgment. We are going to the Supreme Court of Appeal. And we said, well, if you go to the Supreme Court of Appeal, we're going to oppose that. So we opposed that. Then the Supreme Court of Appeal, before the matter was heard before the Court of Appeal, the, the court said, the two parties are instructed to get together to need to try to reach a settlement. And we all thought that it's a futile exercise. We're never going to reach a settlement about this. There was an external mediator. And we had a two-day mediation, me and Kali Kriel from AfriForum and uh, representatives from Tau SA with Query Mantashe and Julius Malema. We spent two days in Johannesburg. And the morning of the second day, the ANC turned its position around. They said... Julius Malema and Gwede Mantashe both said, we are going to stop singing this song. We are not going to, to, to continue with our appeal. And I think the reason why they said that was because I think politically the pressure was too much and it had a very big international backlash in terms of the, the international community's view on, uh, on, on the ANC as being this party of Mandela and this party of peace. So the ANC during those negoti negotiations said, okay, we are going to stop singing this song. So what's the point then in us saying, no, we need to go to court. You don't want to sing this song, but we want to go in court in any case, because what's, what will happen then practically, the matter would be thrown out and we would be ordered to pay their legal fees. Well, they never stopped singing the song though. No, they have. I've never heard them sing that song no, again. Lema hasn't stopped. He sings it every, every single weekend on his speeches. I've, I've just heard another video of him singing that two days ago. Uh, it was recorded. Malema. Yeah. Remember, we're talking about Dubala Ibunu. Oh, okay. Not Kill the Boer. No, it's, no so, Kill the Boer is also hate speech. Um, so so, so this, this whole court case was just about that one song, Dubala Ibunu, which is quite significant. I, I, have to, I have to say this. If you want to see Nelson Mandela sing that, there's quite a few clips of him singing that on YouTube available. So go check that out. But in any case, so that was just about this one song. It wasn't about all hate speech, like saying Kill the Boer that Malema says all the time now. Uh, Yes, there were a few. So just to sum that up. So what the settlement then said is the judgment stays the same. In other words, the song is hate speech. We're not changing. No one's changing what the judge found. The order changes from you are not allowed to keep singing this song to we are going to stop singing this song. That's basically the practical consequence of that. So um, 
and the INC, there was a dispute. The INC said they cannot, they cannot sign, and it's true, it's a valid argument. They said they cannot sign a settlement that their members will never sing this song. Just the same way AfriForum can never sign a document that says our members will never do X. Um, so the ANC then said they would encourage their members not to sing this song. And there's a video clip on YouTube where they had a press conference and they said people should stop singing this song. Um, so there were there were a lot of technical things there, but broadly speaking, that's the case. I think hate speech is still a very serious problem. Dubula Ibunu, I, re I haven't heard it sung. I've heard it sung uh, two years ago, I think, by a group who protested somewhere, but I haven't heard the ANC or Malema sing it again. And if they do, they would... We'll have to get a legal opinion on that, but they would probably be in contempt of court, which means that they would then have committed a crime. Um, so I don't think that we should ever try to think that one court case on hate speech would solve the hate speech dilemma for all time. I think hate speech is a very serious reality in South Africa. Um, but I don't think that the settlement is supposed to be controversial. I know it is because people here are ah, settlement. AfriForum signed a document that the ANC also signed. Yes, we did. But you need to understand the context of that settlement. I don't think that it's not supposed to be controversial. The ANC said, we're going to stop singing this song. We're not going to the Court of Appeal. Let's put it in writing. All right. Here's a question from Johan. Afri Forum has about 230,000 members now paying a monthly fee. So we can accurately guess how much money you make. But will you tell us in any case how much you make and how it is spent exactly? And then he also has a follow-up question here, which I'm also going to read. Uh, Adams, you said previously that well over 90% of your members are Afrikaners. Can you ensure us Afrikaners that well over 90% of your funding are being pumped back into the Afrikaner belange, was his words, and not Afrikaans belange? Well, it's hard to answer that question because it's. I think it's very vague. Uh, I think people can see what we spend our money on. Uh, we They can... they. We communicate about what we do. They can look at the campaigns that we have. They can look at the money we spend to go abroad against expropriation without compensation and farm murders. Um, they can look at the different court cases and the different issues. I think the, I think more than 90%, I, I made that reference earlier about Afrikaner members. I didn't, um, I use it as an example. We don't know because we don't ask people when they sign up, what race are you and what cultural group are you from? We don't even ask that. Our view is we have a certain position and that's what we take. And if you support that, then you can become a member. That's how we differ from a political party. Political party is the other way around. Members decide what the policy should be. Um, so I think more than 90% to use that reference of what we do, we believe is in the interest of everyone. Um, so we have this very strong campaign against farm murders. We believe it would be in the interest of everyone in this country for farm murders to stop. We have a campaign against expropriation without compensation. We believe it would be in the interest of everyone in the country for this not to continue because if it continues it's it would be to the detriment of all so um i think that's it's that's what we spend our money on and i think it's 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 public knowledge uh, what we do there's, there's nothing that we do we don't communicate about um or the only well we have expenses in terms of overheads and administration and, and and so forth and paying rent for this building that we're sitting in those are all that's a big cut from our um from our expenditures but the rest is evident i think for people to see all right here's a question that i've seen a lot here in the in the comments as well being asked uh why are you accepting so much money from evie de clerk and his stichting and what are their conditions for giving you this money that you have to uh do <laughs> well uh, uh, with all due respect i think it's a ridiculous question i can ask that person i don't know who that person is i can ask that person why are you accepting money from george soros um so you can ask or why are you beating your wife um we're not accepting any money we're not getting any money from we get our, me our money our, our income is from our members um, and I think it's malicious. And I think people who keep saying, I know there are people, and I, and I think that is a very small group. It's less than, I think it's less than 1% of, of Afrikaners. But we do find that there, there is a small group of people who keep trying to convince everyone that AfriForum is part of some conspiracy. And yeah, some Bruderbond, I think a Bruderbond slash Afrikanerbond, as it's known now, if W de Klerk, um, there's this whole, this whole conspiracy. The point is, if we were part of some conspiracy with, let's say, with former President F.W. de Klerk, we wouldn't have criticized the way in which they dealt with the negotiations in the early 90s. If you look at the second half of Tainted Heroes, 
you can look you can watch the documentary for yourself i was i, I wrote the script for that documentary you can watch that documentary and see if that looks like a that seems to you like a script that was written by someone who's on the payroll of the former state president um and and we've Kali Krill has written an article earlier this year in which he uh, expressed his, it was after the, the Kofsi's uh, language, Afrikaans uh, uh, language judgment about how Afrikaans should be taken away as language of instruction at the University of the Free State. And his response was, this indicates to us that we were misled by the National Party. Um, so if we were somehow on their payroll, as this conspiracy is trying to suggest, we wouldn't have said that, because uh, then they would have just closed the tap. And... Um, our business model, to use that term, is it's there's nothing, there's no hidden agenda behind it. The principle is, if you are a mem if you agree with what Afri Forum does, you become a member, and our members can can uh, can uh, would agree to that. They they make a monthly contribution, and that's what we use to to fund our activities. Well, actually, first I'm going to say I'm not going to lie. Conspiracy theories is, uh, is a lot of fun. <laughs> it's it's a lot of fun listening to someone who makes them up. And it's a lot of fun to make them up yourself. And yeah, uh, even if you don't agree with the person making up these conspiracy theories, really, it's it's really entertaining. I think that's probably one of the most entertaining things in this world is, is conspiracy theories. But in any case, um, I have to add something to that. I don't know if you watched the the Afrikaner Bond that they, uh, what did they call it? That, um, yeah, what that uh, meeting where they had Ramaphosa speak and they their leader speak and what what it not. So their leader actually had a very low blow there for Afri Forum, where he talked to President Sir Ramaphosa and he said, "We are not going to run to Australia. We're not going to run to America. We're not going to run to Donald Trump. We are going to go back to the principles of the Rainbow Nation." We're going to go back to Albert Luthuli. We're going to back to to go back to to, to uh, the beautiful, peaceful things that we put, see potentially in this country. And I had quite a chuckle at that when they said that. So, um, yeah, I don't know if if Afri Forum is funded by all this Bruderbond or Afrikanerbond money. Why they why they had that low blow in there? But any case. I've just got one more question that I've received uh, via Twitter uh, from Martin. Uh, when Afri Forum was started, you said you are evol involving all Afrikaner groups to work together for Afrikaner interests. However, many Afrikaner groups were not invited to this meeting of your foundation. Who, who exactly were invited here and who was not? And why did you not invite the ones uh, that was not invited? Um. Wow, it's hard to answer that question because I don't have the uh, the facts. Uh, Afri Forum was founded in 2006. Um, I was involved since the beginning. Afri Forum started with three employees. I wasn't on the an employee at the beginning. I, I was involved with Afri Forum Youth. Um, I don't know. It's hard for me to answer a question that's that particular or that specific about something that allegedly happened in 2006. What I can say is that uh, we try to especially with other Afrikaner organizations. We have a broad approach there in the sense that we try to work together where we can if that cooperation is based on on um, buena fides, on, on mutual recognition and respect. Where we disagree, we try as far as possible not to attack each other or other uh, such groups in public. Um, what I do find, what we do find that happen sometimes with, with groups that are Sort of, let's say, position to the right of Afri Forum is they would they would publicly attack Afri Forum and they would accuse Afri Forum of being involved with conspiracy theories, and then the next day they would accuse Afri Forum of not wanting to work together with them. So you have to choose which one you want to do. You cannot publicly attack an organization and be angry about the fact that they don't want to work with you. Um, so we are prepared to work with other organizations. Um, what about the OVB? Uh, well, the RVB isn't really in existence anymore, but well, they've got fifty thousand members. They claim so. That's well, Black Lives Matter also claim they have fifty thousand members. Well, that's about a quarter of what Afri Forum claims to have. So, uh, don't you think they are quite a significant organisation? No, you can work with the no, it's not. The AWB has. Uh, I'm. I would guess they have less than a hundred members. Um, you can claim to have fifty thousand members. We claim to have more than 200,000 members, but also when we testify in court about that, we would never give away our members' information, but you can ch it is possible to check whether we are lying. If we lied about our membership, we would have been caught out. How? Because um, 
if our membership is questioned, let's say in a court case, our response is we're not going to give you our membership list, but you can come to our office and we can show you. Um, and people, some of the viewers can testify that, that they would say, yes, I'm a member of Afroform. So we would have been caught out long ago if we were lying about this. I don't think, I have to say, I think um, we also have a principle of being morally, um, we believe that we should be morally correct in what we do. And I don't think that that the AWB is an organization that has achieved that. I think a lot of what they have been doing, you can talk about the intentions, but a lot of what they have been doing was more detrimental to the to the Afrikaner than good. For example, um, I think the AWB had, had succeeded in attaching a particular stigma to the fear clear flag, uh, it, which is supposed to be a cultural flag. It's a, it's a flag that is regarded as having, as, as, as being the symbol of racism because people have been waving that flag while driving on the back of buckies and throwing black people with bricks, bricks and that type of thing. And that's a less than 1% small minority a group that's doing that. I'm not saying why people are generally doing that. I have a loyalty towards the flag because that was the flag under which my forefathers fought against the British. But I find it frustrating that if you, that that flag is associated with, with right wing racist extremism. And I think the reason why we are in this, this situation with this particular flag is largely because of the fact that a very small group of, of Afrikaners have, have achieved this to discredit the, that flag as an example to such an extent that we can't really use it anymore without going into a lengthy explanation of what the flag is really about. Yeah, I think it's really sad that the uh, fear clear has that negative connotation to it. And I think it's largely due to them. I would enjoy playing devil's advocate here and say, uh, well, I don't think uh, the RBB has ever been proven to have lied about their membership either. So, <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. Adams actually told me that he had to almost go now. So um, I think we, we can, we can, if he wants to do one more question, um, but I'm, I don't think they, I really did see a, a very, another question here. So maybe if you guys throw in your questions now and uh, we've well, got, yeah, you know, we can make a closing comment. But in any case, so um, if you haven't yet, remember to like this video. I see there's like 300 people watching at this moment and only 100 likes. So you guys should go like it. <laughs> in any case, and, and subscribe if you haven't yet to this channel, because this is the type of things that we talk about. And I think most people who are still watching this would know that th they enjoy watching this type of content. But in any case, let's see what uh, questions there are. Um, I don't think there's any questions coming now here. Um, I don't <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think the fear clear will be South Africa's flag again? But in any case, Adams, uh, why don't you just make your closing statements and then we can we can cut off this. And thanks, for, guys, for watching. Thank you, Willem, and thank you for participating. And I, I, it's really enlightening to have this discussion um, because I think it's we know that in terms of the media world, we are moving into a new era where... Um, we do know things are gonna change. As much as I love reading the newspaper every morning, I'm very sure that my children would not read the newspaper in the morning. And I'm pretty sure that I wouldn't be reading the newspaper in the morning in five years from now, as much as I would like to. And we do know that social media is becoming more um, acceptable and um, or not acceptable, more applicable as a method of getting your news, especially through YouTube and so forth. And I think this is uh, very important. Especially because data is becoming so cheap now and i think maybe in two three years everyone will have uncapped data on their phones and in their homes so i think this is the future yeah yeah exactly and i think willem to you as well um the what you've been doing i mean you've only been doing this for i think two months and you've really become a um a leading figure as a youtube commentator in south africa and i think maybe just as a general closing comment i think it's important that we should have these discussions and we should talk about the things that we disagree about and we should talk about it publicly as well. But we should also acknowledge, I don't think the prerequisite for working together should be that we need to agree on 100% of things. Even if you agree on 50% or 80%, we can still work together on those things with, uh, on which we agree. And I think if we can, we can accept each other's um, intentions or, or not judge others by you know, attributing conspiracy theories or bad intentions to them, I think that alone already would put us uh, in a much better place. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Aaron, for coming on. And yeah, as Aaron said, I think this is wonderful that the media can't control what people hear anymore so much because everyone has access to these things. And 
now we can talk about stuff that the build or the report or whatever would never write in articles in there and probably 10 times as many people are going to see it so that's what's wonderful uh, to me the future that we are all moving into in the media and the commentary so in any case guys thank you very much for for tuning in and uh Share this video with your with your friends. Sorry, <laughs> I think a lot of them will enjoy the discussion we had here as well. Goodbye.